Welcome to Politicus, the only podcast that discusses politics and public service from the Portuguese American perspective. Here we discuss everything from federal policy, local issues, and U.S. Portugal relations with the goal of driving more discussion and awareness of the issues affecting our nation, our community, and what we as Portuguese Americans can do about it. And now, Politicus. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Politicus. My name is Angela Samos, and I'm here with my co-host, Denise Borges. Hi, Denise. How are you? Fine. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing very well. Good. So today, we have a, a different type of conversation. We have uh, historically interviewed Portuguese-American elected officials or, or folks who serve in some public service capacity. But Palkus recently put out a statement about uh, supporting the Black community because it's, you know, you can't keep your head in the sand about what's happening in our world today, right? And so we felt it was uh, necessary and, and relevant to, to acknowledge what's happening and having some hard conversations about that and acknowledging the hard issues that exist in our, our community, one of those being, being racism. And so we thought, well, what better place to start with that conversation than at home? Now, uh, we have today we have the Geraldo family, uh, Manny and Ingrid, and their two sons, Alex and Manny. And Manny, uh, and I'll have you guys introduce yourselves in a minute, but Manny has been, is a founding member of Palkus, uh, so has been involved with the organization almost from the very beginning, um, and has been on the board of directors for, I think, going on close to 30 years now. So it's been quite a, <laughs> quite a long time. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is going to be the first of many conversations we have on this topic. And so Manny, we invited you and your family to come on and talk about what your experience has been like uh, being a biracial family. And so, you know, we'll, we'll, we have some questions for you, but we would love for you to all introduce yourselves and, and then talk about your experience and specifically within the Portuguese community, uh, because we want to talk about what can we do better as a community to to embrace everyone and you know make sure that people don't ever feel ostracized or ridiculed or you know discriminated against in any way so that's where we'd like to the conversation to go so hand it over to you guys for to introduce yourselves go ahead sons my name my name is alexander Geraldo. i'm the the younger son happy to be here my name is manny Geraldo the second I am also happy to be here. I think this is an, an important conversation, and I want to thank you for inviting us to have this conversation. No, thank you. And I forgot to mention that that you also, Manny, Manny too, as we used to call you, um, also served on the Palkus board for a number of years, and so we were uh, appreciative of your service there. So thank you. Thank you. I'm Ingrid Geraldo. I have um, the pleasure of being part of this wonderful family, but I want to thank you, Angela, for inviting us today to talk about this really, really important topic. And hopefully your viewers will get some interesting information, insightful information from the conversation. Great. And I am Manny Geraldo, and I am the father of those two wonderful boys, Manny too, and Alex, and my wonderful wife who is on. And I'm very appreciative of Palkus doing this uh, was something that Angela and I had talked about when we had a discussion on the board about the, the, the Black Lives Matter and I shared some things with her and uh, as chair she thought it was important that we have it as as did Denise and, and uh, other board members so I'm thankful uh, to you guys for doing that. No, oh, thank you for participating. Um, and so, Manny, talk, talk a little bit about your connection to the Portuguese community growing up, and then you know, how did you meet Ingrid, and um, and then you know, go from there. Okay, so I um, was born and raised in the Ironbound section of Newark, which uh, is a very diverse community. In my earlier years, there was a large Portuguese community, but it really blossomed. I believe it was in the '60s, and I've always been in a, I've always been the type of person that um, enjoys learning about other people and everything, and uh, associating with 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 different folks. and And the Ironbound at that time was, as I said, was very diverse, and 
I participated in the Portuguese church. We had a, Our Lady of Fatima, and Our Lady of Fatima had a, a CYO, which I, which I was a member of. And then when I became older, it became the CYA, Catholic Young Adults. And I was very involved in that. And from there, I went to high school. And that's about, that's about my, my story. And then how did you and Ingrid meet? We met down here. <laughs> so so uh, did you go to college in D.C.? How did you end up in D.C.? Okay, so I went, you know, I, I went to, uh, I went to high school. I went to Seton Hall Prep, which was a prep school in South Orange, New Jersey. And it was just interesting that I decided to go. Oh, my two brothers got to the local high school. Uh, but for some reason, I was attracted by this prep school. And my father, always being so supportive, uh, as much as he could, he said, okay, well, then let's go. You want to go there? You go there. So he struggled, and he paid for me to go there. And so I went to high school there. Then I went to college at Seton Hall as well, Seton Hall University. Uh, after the university, or before I graduated from the university, I served some time in the military. I came back. I graduated from the university. I uh, worked for the Essex County Sheriff's Department as a deputy officer for a year while I was waiting for admission to law school. Then I went to uh, Rutgers Law, graduated. Then I had an option of whether to uh, stay in Newark. And at that time, I was already involved in the community because I was an uh, organizer of, uh, in New Jersey. It's called the Congress of Portuguese Speaking People. And that was a name that me and a couple of other people decided upon because we wanted it to be broader than just Portuguese Americans, but we wanted to include everybody who came from a, a, a Lusophonic country. So we had that organization. And then from there, I became involved in, in local politics. When I graduated law school, I, was, I had done some, some work for Peter Rodino, who was chairman of the Judiciary Committee at that time. I walked around Down Neck with him. That's the other name for the Ironbound, Down Neck, during the Nixon impeachment proceedings. Talked to people, introduced, uh, introduced the congressman to the community. And he was a very good friend of the Portuguese community, especially, and not only the Portuguese community, but also just generally for, uh, for immigrants. Then I became involved in the uh, city politics. And once I got out of law school, I had an, an option of either working for the United States Attorney's Office in Newark, uh, but it was the opening wasn't going to be for about six months to seven months. And I chose, and I had an offer to work uh, in the honors program and at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So I chose I chose the latter, and uh, that's how I came to Washington. So then you, you meet Ingrid, you fall madly in love because she's beautiful mm -hmm. and, uh, and has a wonderful personality. <laughs> and, um, and so let's fast forward a little bit. So you're... So I have two children. Go ahead. Uh, Manny, Manny and Alexander, and uh, they are, as you say, biracial. And it was funny because I always thought myself, and I realized, you know, if I said I don't really see color, and I don't, but but I understood later on how that is is uh, a misnomer right. in society. But I really didn't understand the issue of race. I never saw my children as one race or the other. I didn't steal on them Portuguese, but there was one time, and I think I shared this with you, the, the, the kids were younger and I was in a, I think it was a mm -hmm. video store. Alex and Manny went off and they were looking and I was in the store and I saw this guy following them. And I was wondering, so why is he following them? And he, was, he wasn't he was following anybody else. So I went up them, so I saw, and then they, started talking to them as if they were doing something wrong. And, you know, obviously they were just shopping. So I went up to the guy and I said, these are my children and I don't understand what you're doing. They're not going to do anything wrong. And, and they did. 
And it was just a, as a result of them being black. So, so that's when I realized, okay, I've got to address this issue differently. And so go ahead. I was just say, so, I mean, from the very beginning though, like for example, how did your parents react? Was it a non-issue for them Man. or, you know? It was an issue. Never told me. Let me tell you. That's great. Uh, you know, my, my, yeah. I mean, my birth mother passed away when I was four or five. And so I was raised by my father. And my, after I was about two years old, my dad remarried. By that time, uh, you know, I was already, I was, I was about 22, 23 years old. But he adored his grandchildren. I mean, and and they'll, yeah, when you speak to them, they'll they'll give you an idea in terms of how how uh, how much he loved them and how much they loved him. So that respect was never an issue. Okay, and then and I can speak a little bit. Yeah, to go that ahead. Because you know, and my brother may have probably would have similar thoughts, but we certainly didn't really feel anything different from on our Portuguese side. They were just our family. You know, my grandfather loved us dearly, treated us such. My grandmother the same. Our uncles. My brother had a, a, an amazing relationship with our Uncle John, my father's brother. So really, from that perspective, even our cousins, you know, and our cousins are just, I do look closer to my dad than us, obviously. It was just one family. It never really played a role, you know, the fact that we were biracial or anything of the sort. Mm -hmm. And I can say the same, at least from my recollection, from my mother's side of the family and how they interacted with uh, my Portuguese side when they would visit, you know, it was, it never really played a role. However, I think we were all aware that we had a different cultural upbringing and we probably experienced different things um, in our adolescence and even till today. So. I mean, that's really awesome to hear. And now I'm curious, did you end up, um, did you go to many Portuguese uh, events? Like, did you visit Newark and go to the club and stuff like that? And then, I, so, you know, how, so, cause I'm curious how the Portuguese community uh, treated you. Is there a specific person you're asking or? Or, uh, you know, any, anybody wants to, to, the answer to the question. I mean, it, whether it was Manny when you were were first dating, or when you first had your kids and you brought them home, or because I know that there's not a they're not like Portuguese clubs in Washington D.C. per se, right? Um, I know there's one in Manassas, and I think there's a community in right. in Maryland. So just trying to get an idea of you know um, when it came to the well, Portuguese community, how how did that play out? So I mean, I could just. They, uh, uh, Manny and Alex would come with me. We would visit. We would visit friends of ours that were Portuguese uh, from Portugal that lived in this area, and it, it was fine. We, you know, we'd go to Mr. Abilio's house, or Mr. Nazario's house, and, and we'd have a uh, eat sardines, eat figs, and it, it was fine. Um, it was never an issue, and. You know, I, both uh, we both, I, you know, we took the children uh, uh, to Portugal, and they met their cousins there, and they really had a good time, and there was no issue there as well. So, uh, Manny, you would say that that there hasn't that you've never felt any sense of uh, of, of issue when it comes to race within the Portuguese American community, or was it something that maybe you didn't see it yourself because it was more family and friends, but maybe at a, different, at a social uh, gathering, it would be a little bit different or none at all? I never, I guess it was more the the, la, in, the former in terms of mm -hmm. families and friends, but you know, I used to take them, we would go up to Newark pretty regularly in the summer because uh, my dad had a place at the beach and you know they uh, the kids really like the beach, so I would we would go up there. But again, we were mainly with family uh, and friends. But it, it was it was never an issue. I mean, you know, the only time that I really saw an issue was that early incident that I told you about. That I knew that was basically uh, as a result of, of of them being black. So you know, and I handled it, and I was prepared to handle it if it ever came up. And many have you. Has the issue, have you seen it differently in mainstream America outside of the Portuguese community? 
I've seen it more in the way that with other people looking, I mean, when they were younger and I would be pushing them in the carriage. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I could, you know, people would look, but I, you know, they, you know, they would wonder how is that his, how is that his child? But I mean, you know, that just attribute that to ignorance, but I never really had a problem. I think they, Maggie and Alex could probably speak better on that than I, than I can. Sure. Yeah. I'd like to hear from both of them. What do they think? Well, I can say like our experience with the Portuguese culture growing up was probably a quite limited. And I'd say we grew up in uh, Prince George's County, which is a predominantly black county. I have been to the club in Manassas a number of times. I recall Palka's events when I was young, but the trips to New Jersey, um, both to Newark and the Toms River, I think were really like a cultural immersion from my brother and I. We were surrounded by our Portuguese family. We ate uh, traditional Portuguese foods um, and people still spoke in Portuguese. And, uh, you know, my aunt, um, who's no, or my great aunt, who's no longer with us, um, used to have these, you know, great barbecues um, at Tom's River. And she would invite some other cousins who I think were probably on her husband's side. Um, and so we kind of got this immersion that I think we lacked here in the D.C. area. But to give a lot of credit uh, to Palkus, you know, as we got older, it was that annual event where uh, we got to see you know, Portuguese culture and see all these different people. And I thought it was always interesting because the different shades of people. Um, so, you know, there were some Portuguese people who were more brown skin. Sure. And so, you know, one of the things I think when we're having this conversation is, you know, lack of representation. And I don't believe that Portuguese people are represented enough in the media. And so you don't really get to see how they can look very different. It's a great point, right? Because our, just as a culture, we have had so many influences that we don't necessarily, you know, we don't all look the same. <laughs> and, you know, it's, oh, it's so it always cracks me up when someone says, oh, they don't look Portuguese. Well, you know, neither does my husband. So <laughs> by that definition. <laughs> um, so it's just always funny to hear someone say that. So I think it's a great point that you bring up. But uh, and I think that was Manny that was talking. So Alex, I don't know if you have some thoughts. I second everything my uh, my brother said. It's completely true. The only thing I would add is I do recall our trip to Portugal. And I remember that being one of the first times for me, I must have been nine or 10. And just to see the different shades, it was certainly surprising me because I had never seen that, you know, especially with all, even all the different events that we would uh, attend just from a family standpoint. Most of my Portuguese family all pretty much looked the same. So when we went to Portugal to see so many different shades, mm -hmm. that was certainly eye opening. Right. And then just to double back on my brother's comment about uh, media and specifically TV and movies and that medium, film as well, you know, even individuals who were Portuguese, they would change their names or something and mm -hmm. we wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. So, and there certainly weren't any sitcoms or anything of the sort that was centered around it. So a lot of our cultural upbringing, certainly in that regard, was, you know, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Martin, things of that nature, as well as comic shows like Saved by the Bell. So I think the lack of representation certainly plays a role in, you know, your connection to mm -hmm. your Portuguese roots because you just don't see it on a daily basis. And I always found it funny because my father would point out people that he knew that was Portuguese based upon last names. But these individuals, these celebrities them themselves didn't bring it to the forefront. Yeah, that's still still an, an issue <laughs> with many celebrities today. Um, Ingrid, and so I would love to hear from you on you know, as you started to attend uh, events with Manny, Portuguese events, you know, maybe specifically Palkus events, how was your experience? I mean, were, did you ever feel, you know, that you were, I guess, discriminated against or did you, was it just kind of, again, a non-issue because, you know, because with Manny, it was a non-issue, you know what I mean? I'm just curious as to what you're... Yeah, for me, I, it was pretty much a non-issue. I think that... Um, in some ways, I was I was sort of welcomed in the group sometimes as being Portuguese because I'm one of these, 
you know, physically, I think I have the ability to be a chameleon sometimes just because of my multiracial background myself. So I sort of fit in. And a lot of times people would, you know, just inevitably start talking Portuguese to me, which made me feel really comfortable. But then I'd have to go get Manny to translate. And then the whole, you know, that would bust open my game. <laughs> I wasn't Portuguese, right? So. I remember a couple of times, I remember one event, I think, and you were there, Angela, I think at that time I had my hair cut really short. It was at a Palkas event and my hair was a, like a platinum blonde. Uh, I guess. Uh-huh. But he came up to me and thought I was Marissa, Marisa, right? Marisa, yes. <laughs> and and I, I'm telling you, I think I was, I disappointed more people that night after they found out that, you no, know, wasn't, that's not who I am, right? <laughs> and so... I felt very comfortable. You know, I've even told people stories about my mother-in-law teaching me um, Portuguese words. And the first words she taught me were all the bad words. But, you know, it was it was just an attempt and an embracement of the culture. And, and like the boy said, I think when, you know, going up to New Jersey was really where the immersion happened. I mean, everybody was just embracing. It, it wasn't there was, n- there was no racial differences. It was just, here we are, here's our family, sit down and have something good to eat. And you could feel the love and support. And, and again, you could go from one room where the conversations were all in English and another room where the conversations were all in Portuguese and a third room where there was a combination of, of languages going on. Mm-hmm. And again, it wasn't, no one stopped to say, oops, the mm-hmm. room, let's change up the, know the conversation it, that never happened. so we were you know I always felt very um, uh, accepted and never felt anything different I think and again a lot of that is attributable to maybe Manny's family in general you know, the connection that they have together growing up and they were a very tight family so uh, you know I think the difference is like the boys also said is in this area, growing up in the Washington, D.C. area, um, there's not a lot of a Portuguese influence or culture. So it was, you almost felt it was definitely, you're either black or you're white, right? That's the way that it's, it's sort of, things are sort of defined in this area. And so there was just, well, you're black and that's it. And, you know, and you're put in that category. It wasn't any other category mm-hmm. to fit into. And so that was a little too right because there is another piece of your background that they that they missed mm-hmm. out on a little bit you know not being that immersed in that totally all the time so and in taking those the, those the, these wonderful family uh, memories that you've shared all of you um and, and taking it you know beyond the portuguese american community because ingrid touched upon you know you know you're either black or you're white in certain areas and, and some of the issues that we're still faced today in America. Um, one of the reasons, uh, you know, we're obviously the podcast and, and, and Palkus made, uh, for my opinion, uh, a very strong statement uh, about how we are as a society and, how, and what the discussions we need to have. And I can start with, you know, start with Manny and, and Ingram and uh, Ingram and everyone else. But I'd like to, um, my, my basic question was, um, how does the Portuguese American community, maybe we can start with you, Manny, on that. How does the Portuguese American community face these issues that uh, as we mainstream ourselves into American society, uh, allowing us, you know, the opportunity, obviously, to have these discussions, uh, to have a voice, and also being cognizant of our history, of our history of the so-called motherland. Uh, Portugal Portugal has a very, very ambivalent history with racism, Mm -hmm. with with slavery. Uh, We all know the history, and uh, some folks feel we, we as a as a as a culture, the Portuguese culture in Portugal and beyond, have never even faced those issues well enough. And then, of course, we had the fifty years of the Salazar regime, where mm-hmm. just not too recently, someone on a different panel said, you know, that the Africans were painted in Portugal as the enemies because of the colonial wars that were going on. And of course, uh, I know that all of you know this well. And so, how do we bring our experiences and your unique experience, of course? How do you bring those experiences mainstream America and give the Portuguese a voice within the issue of race and racism and Black Lives Matter movement? Well, I think it's a matter of education. And uh, and I think a forum such as this is important. But 
you know, that's one reason why I always believed with, for example, with Palkis, I always thought, I mean, Portuguese American is fine, but I always thought that our community was much larger than just Portuguese American. If we uh, attempt to incorporate all of the Lusophonic countries. Uh, and that's always been something in the back of my mind that I wanted to see Palkus to do for that reason, because in numbers, there's strength. And I still have a vision that in the future, that's, that's where it will be. I mean, the one thing I guess that always, my, my best experience with that though, Denise, is that when down here, I met somebody who was working on putting a memorial to African American soldiers, I believe it was in the Civil War. I can't remember exactly. It's been so many years, and his name was Barboza. Mm-hmm. And I said, "I know this guy. I mean, I know the name. He's got to be Portuguese." And sure enough, I reached out to him and talked to him. But he was Cape Verde, and he was like, "Oh, well, you're from Portugal." I said, "I said, well, no, actually, I'm from the United States, but yeah, my my, my folks are from Portugal, yeah." And it was this. There's, I mean, we knew each other. We got to know each other. But initially, it was this kind of animosity mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, my heritage was from Portugal. His was from Cabo Verde. And so, you know, and they had just recently gained their independence. Mm-hmm. So, but I dealt with them, you know. I mean, you know, I mean, I understood where he was coming from. But that is something, that is a history that we do have to face. And I think it's a history that, uh, the government of Portugal probably, if it hasn't done so already, needs to to make an apology for it. Yeah, there hasn't been uh, something. Well, there's been different aspects of it. But uh, many, do you think that by Palcas, uh, and let's talk about an organization that you're a founding member and you're so dear to your heart, do you think that by Palcas having reaching out to the other Portuguese speaking countries? From the majority of them from Africa and of course Brazil mm-hmm. and, and the other countries. Do you think by doing that here in the United States uh, could uh, bring us into a uh, more of a of an open minded uh, discussion about race in the Portuguese American community? I think so. I think so. You know, it was funny when I was down here. You know, down here I was exposed to many more. Portuguese, or I should say, Lusophonic people from, uh, you know, from Angola and Mozambique. And they came to me naturally because I spoke the language. Mm -hmm. You know, they were, some of them were diplomats, some were from Brazil, and and they were part of the military attache. And the issue of race never came up. I mean, and what was what I found interesting, while they, they were from Angola, Mozambique, they considered themselves to be Portuguese. Yes, they were from those countries, but I mean, they they had that much of a of an affinity for Portugal. Do you think Do you think our community is open enough? The community you've seen, and basically, I know that you know, being uh, in an area that there's not a large Portuguese American community, um, you know, in in, in the Washington D.C. area, but you know, your contacts with Jersey and your contacts with you know mm-hmm. New England as well, and and everywhere else. Do you think the community is open enough to have this dialogue? With the other Portuguese-speaking countries, that would also bring us in, in the same uh, nexus to what's going on in America. They may not, but they may not. I don't know the answer, but okay. I do think, I do think that it's that somebody has to do it, and who better than Palcas? I mean, I think it's a it's a conversation that has to be had. I agree, and I'd like to ask the maybe the you know. Alex and Manny, Manny Jr. and Ingrid as well to 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 have a little bit of a, uh, your opinions on that as well. I mean, how 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 do you feel about uh, having a more uh, uh, having the Portuguese American community have a different voice, a voice that in 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 some of these uh, issues that are going on from uh, from your perspective? Well, you know, I think it would be powerful. I think I want to kind of go back to what I was saying earlier. There are Portuguese people who come in, you know, various shades. And so there could be a Portuguese person who's brown skin who has faced the same level of scrutiny from police or he's mm-hmm. he's been passed over for a job just like other black people who are not Portuguese. Um, and 
you know, sometimes just depending on where you are, they can see a Portuguese name and think that the person is Hispanic. And then they can also face a different sort of discrimination. I think what we're doing now is that all groups, organizations that care about uh, should step up and have a voice and be a part of the solution. It's not going to just take one group or one organization. It's, it's going to take all of them because, you know, what's good for the microcosm is good for the macrocosm. Indeed. And this is Ingrid. I, I agree. I think that, you know, the fact that you leave out certain people from your history that were part of your history just limits you as a population. The diversity factor is so important in terms of of so many things that we do on a daily basis and and including out a specific group just sort of puts you at such a disadvantage that it's it's just mind boggling. Just to have that other thought process going is just so um, dynamic and so um, beneficial to a group as a whole. as, as uh, Manny, too, said that, you know, that is it's just an important component of our daily lives. And it's um, something that, you know, a lot of times when you're in the majority, I suppose you don't see that benefit. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, what we're finding now is is a lot of times, at least from my perspective, is that this current hold on you know, maintaining whatever the white population is trying to maintain, you get the sense now that it's breaking apart and they're just trying to hold on as best they can. And they're so afraid of whatever they think is coming that they're losing sight of the benefits that we can all have as a united front. And so it, it's it's coming out in so many ugly ways right now in my belief is that it'll eventually we will all be one, but it's going to take some time and, and struggle, but conversations like this and having people just listening to each other is so beneficial to getting there. We're eventually going to get there. The world is going to change and it's changing now, but we really need to take the time and just listen to each other and put down those walls of prejudice or whatever it is. And again, it's not a step backwards, it's a step forward. And we just need to embrace it and and say, okay, I didn't, you know, I didn't know that. I didn't think about that. And just take a moment and and absorb what that other culture that you weren't a part of, that you can be a part of now and absorb it and 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 grow from it. Wonderfully said. So to that to that point, you know, we we have all agreed that you know conversations like this are a great place to start. What else would you like to see happen in the Portuguese community, and whether that's something that Palkus does, or something that other organizations do, or maybe there's a you know a, a new group that's formed? What would you like to see happen in the Portuguese community to help further this uh, movement of inclusion and you know really making it so that everybody benefits from working together? Well, I know, this is Manny too, I know for me, uh, there are Portuguese in Newark and in Rhode Island and certain areas, the Portuguese community uh, sits adjacent to the black community. So maybe this is a great mm-hmm. time to kind of build that synergy. You know, I mean, we talk, when we talk about being allies, it's being there and supporting them. And so because there are different shades and because some are lighter than, than others, you know, when they have those walks, where they have those uh, peaceful protests, you know, just that presence there, that would mean a lot. I mean, I wonder, and Dad, maybe you can speak to this, but, you know, Newark does seem to be in a way kind of split. I wonder how often that Portuguese community interacts with the brick city. Hmm. It's a good question. I don't think there was a whole, there, there was a history there as well, but it's a, it, it's made full circle. So I remember growing up in Newark in the 60s, there was uh, a Mary Baraka who was created some demonstrations against the Portuguese. But it was against the Portuguese government at that time Mm because they were still Mm -hmm. they were still they were still in Africa. And it spilled over into the Portuguese community, the down neck area. And it was, you know, and so. The, 
the down neck area, the Portuguese in the down neck area were not able to disassociate from the fact that, well, they're complaining about Portuguese. It must be us, as opposed to what Amiri Baraka was talking about more was the, the colonization by Portugal in, in Mozambique and Angola, uh, particularly. So let's come full circle. Now, Amiri Baraka's son is the mayor of Newark, and he has... He and the Portuguese community have a great relationship. So, and I think it was a matter of the two groups uh, or the two leaders getting to understand one another. And you only do that through dialogue. So. Interesting. I have one question in re in regards to, I know we're running out of time, Angela, but in regards to Black Lives Matter and the movement, and that is, you know, that's something that, you know, was stressed in the, in the Palka statement and other organizations, very few but a couple of organizations throughout California and uh, the East Coast as well have, have uh, taken a stand. But within the Portuguese American community in certain circles, and of course, I'm not generalizing, I'm not just saying it's the Portuguese community, I'm saying within the community, um, there has been, especially for, for those of us who follow social media and, uh, and, and other venues as well, there's been a backlash with the uh, All Lives Matter movement. For someone who is, you know, with your experiences, um, and if any of you, one of you want to take this on or all four of you in a different way is, uh, how do we move this, this discussion forward to within our own community and explain to people, you know, that all lives matter is, uh, something that's always mattered. And, uh, the movement now is for black lives matter. How does, how do you feel, first of all, about that pushback that there has been, I'm playing a little bit of devil's advocate, but there has been. Uh, in certain circles, uh, you know, not generalization and probably a minority, but there have been in the Portuguese American community a pushback to the BLM movement with the All Lives Matter. Well, I, I, it, as far as I know, I know in terms of put it this way, I know people that I that are probably my age, perhaps a little older, that are that that were Salazar believers. Sure. <laughs> So, and, and, you know, their view is, you know, they have a very, uh, a, a very conservative, and I can't even use the term conservative because that's not appropriate, just a uh, antiquated view. And I think the only, you know, these, some people you can change, some people are just unfortunately there. And so I like to look towards the future. Mm -hmm. And I think our youth are the ones that are, are going to make the re that make that a reality where you don't have that resistance to the BLM and you have an, a, that they'll have a greater understanding of what it means. So you think it's generational, uh, Manny? I think part of it is generational, yeah. I mean, you know, and it depends upon how they were raised and, you know, like... I just, you know, well, it certainly does, because in your family, there wasn't that, you know, Ingrid said she never wasn't. felt that. I mean, she never felt that with, an old, with your folks and your older generation. No, oh, I mean, as a matter of fact, my father educated me, and I, I shared this with, with Angela, you know, I was in essentially, you know, like I said, uh, there was a lot of Portuguese there, although the community was very diverse, and I would sit on the porch sometimes with my dad, and this gentleman, very well-dressed, walked by, and he was, and he was black, and he started talking to my father in Portuguese. So I just listened. And I said, and this shows you how, you know, I didn't know anything at that time. I said, Pop. I said, he was speaking Portuguese. He goes, yeah, he's Portuguese. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm like, and you know, but, and before then, I didn't know really, I didn't know that. So that was a new experience for me. So I just think the idea of uh, opening up doors uh, through conversation lends itself to uh, people understanding other people. Yes. Indeed. And Alex and, uh, and many too as well, the, any, any thoughts on that? Any thoughts on the pushback that there has been from some segments of the Portuguese American community to the Black Lives Matter movement? Do you also believe that might be generational? I don't think it matters. I don't really care whether or not it's generational or anything of the sort. If they can't understand Black Lives Matter, they're missing a the point, and Palkus needs to be very strong on it in their support thereof. But, I mean, it's simple as that. All Lives Matter is, is, and Black Lives Matter are not the same. Mm -hmm. Study the movement. If we need to post stuff on the website and things of the sorts, fine. <clears throat> you know, knowledge is important, and trying to explain it to people is always a good route. But... Our stance needs to be solidified and clear, and they need to get on board or not. But Black Lives Matter. Yeah, 
I can't speak to whether it's a generational or not, but I do believe that anybody who takes that stance, it, it's a bit tone deaf mm-hmm. yep. and kind of borders on being kind of ignorant. There has been other race of people in this country that have probably faced your know, systematic racism the way that African Americans have. Maybe you can make a point for Native Americans, but the point is that Black Lives Matter stands for you know, p- putting attention at a group of people who systematically and chronically face poor health, uh, get paid less, uh, and borrow money at the same rate, are arrested more. And so when there's another group of people that can say, we face all the same things, they can check off all those buckets, then you can say all the lives matter. But that's just not the case. And the numbers are overwhelmingly a proof of that. Indeed. Well, and I think, Manny, you um, brought up the, the great point, which I think we'll end on, which is that you know progress is made through discussion and dialogue. And this is the first of many discussions that we will have on this topic. And I wanted to thank all of you for sharing your experience. And hopefully our listeners have been um, inspired or at least caused to think and what's going on in our uh, society today. And um, thank you everybody out there for listening and joining another episode of Politicus. Uh, If you have not hit subscribe, please do so now and share this podcast with uh, friends and family because it is a very important discussion to 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 be had and we need as many people as possible uh, joining the discussion and to even help more people find us uh, if you want to leave an, a review on iTunes that will be that would be great and sorry to do all these plugs but uh, in order to to grow the conversation and grow the listenership of the podcast so that more people hear this important dialogue we we have to give these plugs <laughs> and get people to to get to subscribe um, go ahead, Dinesh. And don't forget. And don't forget to become yes. a member. Don't forget to become a member, right? Yes, membership. <laughs> uh, membership. Uh, Manny knows yes, all about that. Quite, it's quite affordable to be a, a podcast <laughs> member these days. Less than a dollar a week, right? At, at the fifty dollar a year level, so uh, very easy to join online. Um, but but seriously, um, Manny, Ingrid, and Manny too, and Alex, uh, your perspective has been invaluable, and uh, thank you for your time. And we look forward to continue working with you um, on furthering this cause and, and helping our community become a better community. Indeed, it was, a, it was a, an honor to be part of this and to listen to all four of you uh, inspiring and at the same time challenging. I appreciate it very much. And Falcus as well. Thank you. Everybody. All right, everybody. Have a, we appreciate it. Thank you, Manny. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank, you, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Politicus, the official podcast of Palcus, the Portuguese American Leadership Council of the United States. Palcus is the premier national organization representing the interests of the Portuguese American community at large. To learn more about Palcus and how to become a member or to make a donation, visit www.palcus.org. To submit feedback or suggestions about the podcast, email us at palcus at palcus.org. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests of the show are not endorsed by Palcus. Politicus is made possible through the support of the Luso-American Development Foundation.